Um, hi everyone, thank you so much for tuning in today. Uh, I'm Kat, I'm a third year music student uh, here at Homerton and I am so happy to be joined today by uh, British cellist Samuel Shepherd. Hi Samuel, thank you so much for joining us today. Hello, thank you very much for having me. I'm uh, sad I can't be there in person, but uh, yeah, greetings Hopefully from soon. Uh, Salzburg, Austria. Um, well, I thought I should just give a quick uh, sort of update on who Sam is. Uh, so uh, you are one third of the Amatis Piano Trio. Um, so the, the trio was formed in Amsterdam in 2014 by German violinist uh, Leah Hausmann, British cellist Samuel Shepard and Dutch Chinese pianist Menji Han. Uh, the trio were, we were lucky enough to have as uh, the holders of the University of Cambridge's Chamber Music Residency, which was supported by Homerton last year. And the Homerton College Music Society was so, so happy and lucky to have a recital performed by you at our lunchtime recital series. So, um, again, thank you so much for being here. And I think we should probably get a question about the pandemic over and done with at the very start. So. Where are you and are you able to rehearse, perform, what, what's going on? Yeah, tragically, it seems like there's not much else to uh, talk about. It's always on the tip of everyone's tongue, the pandemic. Yeah, it's been very difficult, I think, for all people involved with culture in any way. Um, it's been tough on a kind of personal level and, and uh, close level to us, um, even to rehearse uh, due to certain restrictions and things like this. But um, I'm always one to kind of try and look a bit more forwards and have a bit more positivity about things. And whilst it's terrible, uh, we're very lucky here, um, particularly in Austria, we're kind of well looked after by comparisons. And it's also given us a lot of time to kind of take on new projects, to look after a few aspects of our playing. Like when you're, when you're a professional ensemble and you're touring all around the world and you've got a different concert here and there, you start to neglect certain things just because you don't have the time or you're tired and um, it's been kind of a big reset. So I hope that as the world kind of opens up again, um, the fruits of, of that time we've had to put into ourselves will, will reveal themselves. But well, let's see when this thing ends. No, I, I really, I, I hope so too. Um, but you mentioned new projects, so uh, what, should be look, what should we be looking forward to? Yeah, it, it, when, when you're in this, this pattern of playing your concerts, you kind of have your normal programs and you, you speak to your normal programmers. But we've always wanted to open out and explore other art forms a bit and work with them. So we've got various projects in the pipeline. One is working with chocolatiers and we're curating a program around around music and taste and it'd be amazing fun we're also doing something with the egyptian soprano fatima saeed who we met on the bbc new generation artist uh, scheme called around the world in 12 songs and they're they're much more well this this project's much more kind of theatrical and slightly out of the realm of what we normally do and uh it's a little bit more commercial as well. And I'm someone who didn't grow up in the classical household. My parents were not musicians and I loved music, but I hated the sort of staleness of classical music and that kind of very formulaic approach to things. And it's quite fun to be exploring music now that we never would normally play outside of our our normal repertoire and and also exploring how to perform on our instruments in a way like let's say I'm having to imitate a guitar I mean that's kind of one thing but then what about an ahu um, the Chinese violin and like what's what's these kind of what's the possibilities and the challenges that trying to represent other cultures might present so how do you approach that how do you try and imitate a Chinese violin I mean that sounds fascinating <laughs> yeah I, <laughs> It's got a very, well, it's very evocative sound and it's, it's very specific. It's got a kind of nasalness and tightness to it. Um, and so if you're going to imitate that on our instruments, it's, it involves certain 
technique things I don't want to get too boring with it but it would be about playing very close to the bridge and a certain kind of uh, hand pressure as well in the left hand that creates this slight hollowness in the tone that is a really beautiful sound and it's hard to achieve on the cello but uh, on the violin I think obviously they're quite closely related in terms of size and pitch and it works really well and I this 12 songs project we're we're exploring 11 different countries in total because there's two in America and um, we've also got like stopovers in different countries as well so ultimately we're going to be exploring about 16 musical cultures in total. Oh I really really hope that you can do that as soon as possible. Um, I, I saw that you um, as a trio have performed in over 30 countries around the world so is this like some aim to cover every country around the world um, <laughs> we we kind of you've got your main big cultural hubs in the world so you're you're always going to end up in new york for example mm. you'll always end up in the major european cities and then you've got your kind of off the grid ones where you can provide something they're not really used to and you can have a massive impact. So we, we give ourselves normally one visit per year to somewhere where maybe the pay is terrible, um, but we want to do it because it's interesting and, and we've formed amazing connections. So when we've been to Southeast Asia, it's been so rewarding that you just want to go back as soon as possible. You just do it. And, and India also is a place where we've made a lot of very good relationships there. And it's amazing. You go and, and we play, uh, we play and perform, but we also give master classes. And and there's these kids there that uh, they've got sponsorship, so they can come and study in this school. And at night they go home into almost slum kind of, you know, situation. And there we are teaching these kids, and they just get this beautiful escapism from music. And well, I think that's that's very valuable and maybe they won't become professional musicians because the, the industry doesn't really exist there for them. But it, it fills them with kind of confidence and they're communicating with fellow students there and making friends. And I think that's what music's all about really. Absolutely. So when you, are you doing any masterclasses or anything online at the moment or have you decided to take a clear break of everything virtual and sort of start over when things calm down yeah we've done a bit we did, we did a bit with with Cambridge actually um but it's very difficult to teach on on zoom I mean we're quite lucky we've got some good recording equipment which makes things from our side uh, easier for the students to understand maybe but yeah it's it's very challenging we, we, we are doing things online in terms of live streams and things like this um, it's an interesting new sector that's opened up as a result and actually I think it might weather the storm of us getting back to normal life in a way. Um, if I think about where quality musicians tend to perform it is so centralized in in the, the main hubs that music lovers that are out in the sticks so to speak uh, are going to have had this connection with artists that they wouldn't have normally gotten to see. And I I think it would be a smart thing for people to keep an eye on this market because I, I do think it will uh, have some resilience and stay around for the long term. Oh, I agree. I, I always keep, I, I keep being completely astonished when I realise a lecturer isn't actually in their sort of, I don't know, in, in, in the lecture room that I'm used to them being in and that they're in a house halfway around the world or something like that. But for this industry, it's actually a brilliant opportunity, as you say, for a lot of people to get exposure as well, because they, they might be seen now by somebody who's randomly going online and sort of chances upon some video that's gone viral or something like that, which also is, is just a bigger opportunity now than it was ever until now. And I do think that might stay. And I mean, masterclasses online must be a bit more sort of strained because <laughs> obviously there's less interaction, but live streams, that's, I mean, that's just a brilliant way to go. And I do think that might stay. Yeah, I, I think also it's a very useful tool to utilize for the future. If you think that, um, particularly for us in, in 
chamber music, let's say. But yeah. the, the, the industry of, of classical music is, is relatively small when compared to the rest of the music industry. It's 1% yeah. and chamber music is 1% of that 1%. So, but you can have a career in it. And the point is, is that you don't need to find world domination. You don't need to be the next, the next big thing, but you need to find your tribe. And when, like us, performing musicians, when you're going to a city and you can't return to that concert hall for another two years, it's like, how do you keep that audience connected to you? Yeah. And the only way you can keep this, this tribe going and, and keep piquing their interest and make sure that they're there for you when you come back in two years time, or if you're a composer, it's the same kind of thing. You can't, you can't put out a piece every week, um, but you can put out something which, which they can keep coming back to and keeps them keeps them interested and alert to what you're doing and so I think it's really important that um, young musicians are savvy about these things yeah. we forget a little bit that we live in our kind of little utopias of um, chasing our dreams and and doing what inspires us but without <sighs> well, at least for me anyway, without being able to get out there and play and, and have that connection with an audience, it's, I slowly kind of die a little bit. And uh, you need to guarantee that audience can be there for you. So all of these platforms, all of these ways of marketing yourself is a horrible word, but it's necessary. <laughs> uh, we need to keep our eyes open too. Absolutely. So um, just uh, do you want to maybe sh give a shout out to where you live, live stream and sort of where people can follow you online? Yeah, I mean, we've got all the usuals, the, the Facebooks, the Instagrams, and uh, I don't think we're so active on Twitter. But actually the streaming at the moment we're doing through through concert halls um, because of cancelled concerts. Yeah. So it's not so, uh, I, I couldn't give you a tag to go and listen to us but there's something in the pipeline there we're, we're working on a little bit of a um, personalized platform a kind of uh, integrated social media that's just for for us and for people who want to follow us um, and yeah as I said we have good recording equipment we're very lucky so we've got some big recording sessions coming up in the next couple of months and uh, yeah watch this space yeah absolutely no um I was also wondering so Rehearsals. I I, um, I like to call myself a retired pianist. I am 22 and absolutely <laughs> only thinking of what I'm going to do next, obviously. But um, I did a lot of performing when I was um, a kid and I usually thought of rehearsals as I need to practice on sort of any instrument um, and it's just I need I need to get a, I need to be good at that instrument so that when I'm in a nice sort of hall in a nice acoustic sort of uh, atmosphere and playing on a proper instrument, then it it will sound amazing. Basically, if it sounds good on the on the bad instrument, it will sound brilliant on the on the good one. And obviously, you've got brilliant instruments and you've got recording equipment and all this, but but the atmosphere, the the acoustics, obviously, are a bit more easy to adapt and stuff but it the, the sound itself is going to be so so different and especially without the sort of drive and the, and the adrenaline the way of playing that is fueled by adrenaline that you usually get in a sort of concert atmosphere so have you completely adapted the the way you perform now or is it as in how, how does that differentiate from rehearsals or stuff like that I, yeah, they're, they're totally different processes, a, a performance in a concert and a, and a rehearsal. A, a rehearsal is often quite an intellectual process. You're, you're taking your time, you're listening to what you've just done, you're processing it and, and you work on it and, and practice is like that as well. And concerts are really uh, the moment to live in the moment everything that's just happened, you leave it behind. It's, it's not important anymore at all. And that that you really miss, it, even when you're doing like live streaming and things like this, because the audience is not there, it's hard to transition into that moment of sink or swim. Yeah. Um, there's also pushing everything to the border that you do 
in performance. Mm. It's uh, it's a bit like you know when you watch, you've got an ice skater that goes out and the the last person out on the, in the Olympics and they've got to get that perfect ten score. They you need to be on the edge so so close that that it can go horribly wrong and it does sometimes <laughs> and uh, that's very thrilling and it also means you reach kind of emotional depth that you you can't access mm. in in rehearsal but how do you so, then create that for for live streams for example i don't know if you can I, I i wish i had an answer and if someone does please tell me it's it you you can't you can't fake it mm. um you just have to you have to do the best you can and you get a kind of adrenaline spike from having the recording equipment there which can be useful or knowing it's going out as a live stream and you've got one shot at it it helps um but you miss that contact and it's a bit like when it's, I can't imagine what it must be like trying to do comedy right now. You're, you're standing there and you're telling a joke and no one's laughing. You can't hear any laughter. If under normal circumstances, if you did an hour gig in comedy and got no laughs, your career's over. Yeah. But in this case, it is, it is what you've, you've got to work with. And there's some parallels there with classical music in that during performance, there is this kind of, I, I don't know, you can't understand it, but there's this connection between you and the audience that you can't put your finger on as a performer, but you know it's there and you can feel how much you have them. And so a really kind of obvious example would be if you have a big pause in, the, in this kind of tense pause in the middle of a piece, that the length of that is different every single concert. And it depends on how much you have the audience in the palm of your hand. And when you really have them, you feel totally comfortable to, to stretch it out to your heart's content. And then sometimes you're playing somewhere and maybe you haven't managed to capture the, the moment and you, you're panicking at that moment. You're like, okay, is, is someone gonna cough? That's when you know you're not in the moment because you've got all these stupid thoughts running through your head. You can't replicate this. You need the audience yeah. there and well. Let's hope the vaccine gets us back yeah, soon. Hopefully. Um, so where where would you say then that you've had that best moment so far? I mean, I saw that you've, you've played at the BBC Proms, you played at huge, huge concert halls and big events and festivals. So what was the best, I mean, silly to say the best one, but the best moments that you just described, sort of the one where you were absolutely certain the connection was there and that pause would really work and would have a complete sort of story itself. Yeah, there's there's a few, but I think the one that's most relevant to share actually is quite recently we did a Corona concert. So it had some social distancing and it was towards the end of the summer when things were a little you know, more manageable. And it was in Berlin Concert House in the main hall up there. It's a beautiful hall, massive and not really appropriate for chamber music at all. So beforehand was a bit nervous about how this might go over. And also the program was very strange. It was first and second Viennese school. So we're playing some Schubert and then suddenly you're playing all kinds of modern contemporary stuff. And that always makes you nervous because people come for Schubert, but they don't necessarily come for the more contemporary music. And yet every, every single note the audience was so attentive to, they'd been starved of this live performance for so long at that point like six seven months that they just ate it all up and it was quite incredible feeling to be in this huge hall and playing very intricate chamber music incredibly softly and yet still at the back not a hint of a cough or you, know, you could hear a pin drop and i spoke to a few other musicians around that time who said they've never had the audience be this attentive before. So I think there was, it, it captured a moment. And I think when we get back to concerts, that first few months of concerts will be really amazing, where people are so grateful to get back and have that collective experience again.
Gosh, I, I've genuinely got chills. I'm, I'm sort of imagining it and, and I'm now, uh, I feel quite emotional. I can't wait to go to a concert as soon as I can. Um, well, I, I've really, I, 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 I looked at the time and I thought, no, I, I want to talk to you more. Um, <laughs> I, I want to hear everything, basically. I, I keep looking at my notes that I made, sort of just general questions that I could ask you. And I'm thinking, no, I don't want to know any of this stuff. I don't want to know how you're rehearsing. <laughs> um, I want to hear about all of the amazing experiences. Um, I think I will sort of round off here, but I, I wanted to ask you if you have any tips um, on how to sort of live in the moment and do a, a recording of a piece or I mean we've got um Homerton College is doing a performance competition at the moment and um I saw the guidelines for that I mean I mean it's a three to seven minute video and I simply wouldn't know how to sort of fully be there and how to do that so have you got any tips I think you have to cut down your options um, when you're recording something, you always feel like you can just go back over it and over and over and over again. And, and there's certain benefits to that, of course. You can get out something that you're really proud of at the end of it. So that's useful. But if you're talking about performance and that, that the nature of having one shot at it, it's about creating that environment for yourself. And when we've done cd recordings or something like that there's often this feeling like okay we've we've recorded everything we've got everything covered and, you know nearly all the notes are there now it's time to do a run of it and so often you find that final run just kind of pieces everything together and i would encourage people to do that if they're if they're trying to record a performance um cut down your options and say i've i've got three run throughs get your adrenaline going and you know, if it doesn't go well, then switch it off, take a break, have a coffee and come back. But try to give yourself some kind of restrictions as to how many times you can go over it, because you're going to go crazy. Um, there's no one on the planet who doesn't go completely nuts recording. There's an amazing documentary about Janine Janssen, the, the violinist. She's an incredible artist. And, um, it follows her when she was a bit younger going around the world and performing all the time and all the pressures that were on her and of all the moments that got to her she's endlessly on PR trips and planes and stuff like that the moment that she really broke down was doing a recording of a movement of Bach and it just got in her head and I'm sat there listening to it and I'm quite well educated in these things thinking this is stunning and she's tearing her hair out. And the people in the recording booth were tearing their hair out too, because she couldn't get past herself. She mm. just caught herself up completely. And um, I think she stepped away from it and then came back with kind of a fresh perspective. So give yourself a bit of time to record and find that moment, it'll come together. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for the advice and thank you so much for talking to us today. Um, Samuel Shepherd is part of the Amatis Trio. Please, everybody, check them out. Uh, and I want to thank everybody who has watched this little segment of tuning in. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me.